I'm going to tell you something. If you two never bother with me again, again the rest of my life, I ain't giving up that I can't. I can't. There's good friends of mine out of the f***ing Well, he could go to have to do it first. That's why I said to you before, you, you don't understand what the hell is. It's not what the money is, it's the boss, it's your boss. You ain't supposed to be alive. Because I was making an example out of you for any mother that planted on me again. You understand? So the only reason you're still alive, don't think because we stopped. It was because that woman walked in the door. Then he would have been gone. You aren't supposed to walk away no more. You me, and that was the worst thing you ever did. today uh because that's what i'm going to do right after i'm done recording this uh but we will do the demeo thing next week along with our mini biographies and i think that'll be a good way to go uh, i just want to keep this under two and a half hours because i i just don't want to like punish people all day with information but we're going to go ahead and talk about pittston and pittston you know obviously it's a small northeastern pennsylvania uh, coal mining region, right? So Pittston's population really began to grow dramatically in the 19th century when the coal industry grew. Uh, primarily, uh, they drew in Eastern European and Italian immigrants that were looking for work. And the region also became really a thriving center for clothing manufacturing industries. And one of the larger immigrant groups in Pittston were the Sicilians from Montadoro. Translated into the Mountain of Gold, Montadoro was a sulfur mining town. And over the centuries, locals had developed an expertise in mining, which made Pittston pretty much a, a, the perfect place for them relocating in the United States to go. And among a lot of people that migrated there were Stephen Latore, Santo Volpe, and Charlie Buffalino, known as the men from Montadoro. And they were the founders of what would become known as the Buffalino crime family. So the Latore brothers in 1951, 38-year-old Joe Latore began to share with authorities confidential information about a criminal group called the organization. Joe Latore was the oldest son of former Pittston crime family boss, Stephen Latore. Uh, before the Appalachian meeting and before Joe Valachi and Greg Scarpa's revelations put the mafia on the front page, Joe Latore was giving federal investigators intel about its members and criminal activity, and the FBI would assign him informant symbol code PH-521. And he would basically communicate uh, on and off with the FBI until at least the late 1960s, as far as we know from the paperwork. But Joe was not the only member of his family to start talking. In 1967, his younger brother, Sammy, uh, also became an informant, and the FBI would assign his informant symbol code as PH-872. Uh, neither, brother, neither, neither one of them was a mafia member. They didn't take a blood oath uh, to join the mob. They were semi-legitimate guys. Uh, confessed gamblers with long criminal records. And for the most part, their knowledge of the mafia came secondhand from their father. And I, you know what, guys, I think I have covered this before, but fuck it, we're already here. So uh, their value was basically uh, in retelling their father's criminal past, but at a time when the Pittston crime family had no mem no real made member informants, the brothers were the nearest thing to inside sources the FBI could get. So an FBI air tell of June 26 of 1959 would reveal that Joe Latore was an informant. Uh, Joe was born in Pittston on July 24th of 1913. Him and his father, Stephen, operated the Latore Smoke Shop. The business opera opened in 1941 and was located at 19th South Main Street in downtown Pittston. In 1945, Joe would purchase a three-story building across the street and opened a pool hall called Latore's Recreation. Uh, the business would thrive in the post-war economy, and Joseph would operate Latore's Recreation for nearly 50 years. He was, a very, uh, he was a very active guy in the community, and he would sponsor stuff like bowling leagues, softball games, and pool tournaments, and etc. And Latore's Recreation was really a place for gambling. 
That's where guys could go and lay off bets. It had it literally had a ticker tape and a big scoreboard to keep track of the out-of-town sporting events. Pittston was generally an open town, and authorities tolerated gambling only up to a certain point. And nevertheless, Joe was arrested for gambling at least six times that we know of over the decades. Uh, he would actually die on April 28th of 2001, and an FBI air teller, June 26th of 59, discusses Samuel Latore uh, being an informant. And he was born on July 30th of 1918. He would gra- graduate from Wyoming Seminary, which was a private high school and was a state wrestling champion. He would attend college and would serve in the Navy during World War II. And after the war, Samuel would operate a restaurant for a short period of time, and he would claim credit for introducing the hoagie or the submarine sandwich to Pittston. In December of 52, Samuel was convicting of robbing a drugstore in Syracuse, New York, and sentenced to 10 years on, of probation. So a number of factors uh, would sort of help Sammy uh, avoid prison for that theft. Uh, his minor role in the crime, uh, in the crime, his clean record up to that point, and letters of support from judges, policemen, and bankers attesting to his character uh, would enable him to sort of escape things. But in 1954, they would arrest him for possessing and selling three thousand dollars worth of counterfeit money, ten dollar bills specifically, and he would buy. He had bought them from Charles Parisi, who was a suspected mafia member from Ohio. Sammy possessed some of the bogus uh, used some of these bills and a crap game and sold the rest to an undercover secret service agent. And Sammy would face a minimum 15 year prison sentence if he was convicted for that. And the legal proceedings in that case turned into a real shit show. A reporter covering that trial called it the most unusual series of legal and medical maneuvers ever witnessed in history. <laughs> so on the night before the trial, Sammy crashes his car into a pole and he gets hospitalized for 10 days. His doctors claimed that he sustained severe head injuries in the accident and requested that the trial be delayed. However, three doctors appointed by the court would examine Samuel and determine that he was absolutely fine. At his next court appearance, Sammy arrived at the court building in an ambulance straight from his hospital bed. He attempted to enter the courtroom on a stretcher carried by two attendants, but the judge refused to let him in. The assistant district attorney, Stephen Teller, was absolutely the batshit crazy about it. Get off the litter, Teller said. Get up. You have a better pulse than I got. And the resulting chaos delayed the trial even further. Sammy eventually would plead guilty to those charges, and he was sentenced to a four-year term uh, in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. Uh, but he did get some helpful legal advice. Uh, and Charlie Parisi, who was arrested as well on counterfeiting charges in 54, but before the trial... Latori attended a meeting in the law offices of Pittsburgh attorney Charles Margiotti. Margiotti was the former attorney general of Pennsylvania and a well-known political fixer. In attendance was Samuel's brother Joe and his co-defendant Parisi and Pittsburgh mob members Kelly Manorino and Charles Marchia. Uh, Margiotti uh, advised Latori to act out in court in an attempt to game the legal system. In April of 67, Sammy Latori, age 49, started to share confidential information about the Pittston crime family and its membership. The available FBI files that I have really don't provide a reason for why he was doing this. Uh, And the timing of his cooperation doesn't really overlap any arrest whatsoever. So it's, it's like, wow. Uh, And there's really no evidence available from the FBI reports that I have that either brother was aware that the other brother was talking. So both brothers are talking. One doesn't know the other's doing it. But Sammy would uh, advise that his information was trustworthy because it came directly from his father. Uh, Sammy and his family lived on a, in his father's house. So according to Samuel, he was his father's favorite son, and his father wanted to enlighten him on the organization's membership and activities, which, you know, do we believe that? Eh. So his father takes him into his confidence, he says, for his own personal protection. Stephen Glatori seems to advise his sons to avoid the organization at all costs. The brother's motivation to talk may have emerged from the way the crime family treated their father. Uh, There was a bookmaking conviction that Sammy was, uh, excuse me, Uh, hold on a second, bookmaking, blah, 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 blah. okay. So he tells the FBI that if there was any question that he couldn't answer himself, he would take it to his father and get the answer. So I I think I have done this show. Sorry, guys. Uh, According to Sammy, he had never refused to answer questions concerning the organization. Sammy's first confidential interaction with the FBI occurred on April 20th of 67 when he tipped off federal agents about a stolen load of cigarettes. 
so uh, that case, Sammy Ruggieri and three associates hijacked a trailer from a freight terminal in Kingston, Pennsylvania, which is a borough across the Susquehanna River from Wilkes Bar. The trailer contained 800 cases of Pall Mall and Lucky Strike cigarettes, and the thieves were, un- were able to unload some of the stolen cargo before they were arrested by police. Some of the cigarettes were actually tracked down in Brooklyn, New York, and Sammy's tip led to the recovery of the stolen property valued at $44,000. The FBI noted in its report that he provided reliable and valuable information. Like his brother, Sammy Latore was repeatedly arrested on gambling charges, but he always escaped with a fine. And it's likely, you know, as we know, no coincidence that the brothers, despite many convictions, never saw the inside of a prison again because they were cooperating with law enforcement. Uh, Sammy Latore would die on January 4th of 89. Latore, uh, brother Stephen Latore, was, was born March 8th of 80, 1886 in Montadoro, Sicily. In 1903, at the age of 17, he settles in Pittston. He joins his father, Joe, who had re- relocated earlier. According to Joe Latore, his father, Stephen, started as a coal miner in 1906. Stephen Latore fulfilled a promise and sent money for his Montaduro friends, Santo Volpe and Charles Buffalino, to join him uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. Latore would support Volpe and, the Buff- and Buffalino financially after they first moved to Pittston. They would later become business partners in the coal mining industry. As we know, Russell took over the complete coal mining industry in that area. But Latore admitted to, uh, to his sons that he was a member of the mob. Latore, Volpe, and Buffalino were likely made members in Pittston. Charlie Buffalino was the uncle of later crime boss Rosario Russell Buffalino. Uh, Joe would tell the FBI that Italian organized crime existed in the Pittston area before his father arrived. For many years, black handers uh, extorted Italians with threatening letters, but Stephen Latore and his associates were likely responsible for establishing the separate organization that would later become the Pittston mob family, or as we know, the Buffalino crime family. Uh, That organization's power would peak in the 1960s under Russell, obviously, as we know, and Pittston would become a magnet from immigrants, specifically from Montadoro. So according to Joseph, the organization, uh, the term he used to refer to the criminal group, provided new arrivals with assistance to help them prosper in their new surroundings. Uh, a large percentage of Pittston, Pittston's mob family members were, as we said, born in Montadoro. Over the years, the organization gained power and became involved in criminal activities like bootlegging. In the old days, Joe said that narcotics and prostitution were forbidden, but now anything goes. Western Sicily, according to Joseph, uh, his father was head of the local mafia first. And that probably made him the youngest mafia boss in the country at the time. Afterward, Santo Volpe and Charlie Buffalino immigrated Latori invited them to join the organization. Volpe gradually took over the number one position in the mafia until he became the dominant voice in the organization. Uh, Russell Buffalino and Charlie Buffalino were unpopular with the membership. According to Joseph, Buffalino was only interested in making money and wouldn't accept the responsibility of the organization. The same thing eventually happened to Santo Volpe. Making money became Volpe's primary focus. Uh, and he lost interest in his underworld duties. His attitude changed, caused friction within the membership. As a result, Volpe was eased out of bo- uh, eased out of being boss in 1942, and replaced by John Skiandra. Gelatori would say that Volpe remained a powerful figure within the organization. That word was the influence upon the activities of the organization uh, was paramount. Volpe would die in 1958. And it's interesting to note that all three early leaders of this group eventually became disenfranchised with the organization. John Skiandra, another Montadoro native, headed up the organization for a few years. Samuel Latore would describe Skiandra as very cruel and a vicious leader of the mafia. So according to Joe Latore, Russell Buffalino succeeded Skiandra as the Pittston boss sometime around the middle 1940s after Buffalo, uh, excuse me, <coughs> after Buffalino returned from Endicott, New York, where he was employed by Joe Barbara. Scandra allegedly appointed Buffalino as head of the organization because he wanted somebody he could trust and somebody who would take orders. And Scandra would die in 1949. Uh, Stephen Latore would uh, would actually get shelved, believe it or not, uh, four decades after founding 
the organization. Former boss Stephen Latore was dropped after years of tension between himself and the leadership, according to Joseph and Samuel. The permanent break, which lasted over 40 years, was caused by a series of disagreements that showed Stephen Latore was out of step with the organization and its values. In 1929, the organization would be led by Santo Volpe and Charlie Buffalino. And what had happened was they desired, they, they decided to hire killers to knock off two union officials who were giving them problems. They organized a collection to pay for the murder contract, but Latore refused to contribute any money. And as a result, Volpe and Buffalino had to come up with more money. Uh, and uh, according to this FBI airtel that I have, Latore allegedly testified in court concerning a legal matter related to the United Mine Workers Union in Wilkes Bar, Latore allegedly lost most of his wealth in 1929 as a result of the stock market crash. And to get back on his feet, he borrows a ton of money from Volpe and Buffalino that he refused to pay back. So this is kind of interesting because it's really nothing like insane that 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 Latore gives up. But we sort of know the ebb and flow of, of how Pittston was, was handling business. So the organization tried to enlist Joe Latore to help break a union strike at the mine. However, Stephen Latore refused to allow his son to be involved in cracking heads, which infuriated Russell Buffalino and John Skiandra. Santo Volpe wanted to make sure that Joe Latore, a mob member in the early 1940s, uh, wanted to make Joe Latore a member in the 1940s, but Stephen Latore would object. Stephen Latoria would open up a smoke shop and his son-in-law is actually Angelo Perino, uh, who was a mob member and worked at his business, but he never received an ownership stake. A meeting would be held, excuse me, at the Sterling Hotel in Wilkes-Barre, attended by Santo Volpe, John Skiandra, Angelo Polizzi, and Joe Barbara, Stephen and Joseph Latori. Barbara at the time was a mob member from Binghamton, New York, who was as we know, aligned with Pittston. So because Stephen Latore was a member and subject to those rules, the organization asked Latore who gave him the authority to open his business and exclude Perino. Latore would become angry at the group's questions and told them to go fuck themselves. Joe Latore said the organization used Perino to get, to get at his father. The attempt to force Stephen Latore to cut in Perino for a stake in ownership uh, might have been seen as a provocation by Skiandra to provide him with additional leverage to drop Latori from the crime family. It also gave Skiandra control of Latori's interest in the Knox Coal Company, which, uh, you know, a mining concern that prospered using the organization's connections. So once again, what we truly see here is uh, Skiandra was using a situation that was a beef between you, uh, two men and using it to his advantage. Oh, okay, Latore doesn't want to play ball. Fuck him. I'm just going to absorb his rackets. And we've seen this a million times in organized crime. This is no different. So after Stephen Latore gets shelf, Skiandra strips him of his ownership stake and allegedly used those proceeds to repay the money that Latore owed to Buffalino and Volpe. Uh, so in 1941, moonshine manufacturing became a very big thing. And state and federal liquor agents in 1941 raided a property that property that was owned by Stephen Latore's daughter, Mary, and her husband, Angelo Perino. They would, found a, they would find a 1,500-gallon alcohol still hidden in, in a garage. Joe Latore and Angelo Perino were convicted of conspiracy uh, and of the manufacturing and possession of untaxed alcohol. They were sentenced to short prison terms as a result. So Mary Perino and Samuel Latore were also charged in that crime, but were found not guilty. Um, the final break with the organization occurred sometime in the mid 1940s. Uh, and in different debriefings with the FBI, Joe Latore would give a range of dates between 1943 and 1950 when they got out. So, uh, compounding to that problem was Joe Barbara would summon Latore to a meeting in Binghamton along with Russell Buffalino uh, and John and Angelo Perino. Joseph said that his father was criticized for not cooperating with the mafia. And from then on, he was not considered a member. So in other words, this is the official meeting that gets him shelved. Uh, Joseph didn't use the term, but the organization shelved his father, more or less. Shelving, I've, as you know, uh, was a discipline typically reserved for well-connected individuals who fall out of favor, right? Uh, but they also don't deserve to be killed or wouldn't be killed for political reasons. Basically, they're throwing them out of the mafia, okay? Sometimes that punishment is temporary, 
Uh, but because the, the organization traditionally would reinstate shelved individuals later on down the line, Samuel Latore would tell agents that it was amazing that the organization didn't kill his father. Samuel suspected that his father was allowed to live out because he was respected and also feared. Despite the falling out, Stephen Latore remained highly regarded by the older members of the regime, and they continued to visit with him on it, at his home. So after Sammy decides to become an informant in 1967, the FBI made a play for Stephen Latore. He was assigned informant code PH739-PC. And there's not a lot of evidence that Stephen Latore ever really cooperated. He had retired from criminal activity decades. So Stephen Latore and Steve Latore, Sammy, there's a father and son here. Okay, so just so you don't get confused. Uh, according to the FBI, Latore refused to discuss any matters with them and was af afraid to be seen with agents. That's the father. Uh, Steve Latore remained estranged from the Pittston crime family from the rest of his life. In 1980, he gave an interview with the Times leader, and he would say, "My or Joe, his son, would say, my father hasn't talked to Russell Buffalino in 35 years. There's hard feelings between them. Uh, Steve Latore would die in 1984. Uh, so over the years, the FBI collected uh, a lot of conflicting information about the independence of the Pittston crime family. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because oftentimes what we see is guys give up bullshit information. OK, and I think you guys will be able to, to sniff out what's accurate here and what's not. So some sources with uh, beginning really with Joe Latore suggested that Pittston was a subgroup of another crime family. But other sources, including Samuel Latore, would advise that the Pittston was an independent crime family. And the difference in opinion between sources really kind of shows the intricacies of the Italian underworld were hard to pin down, even between closely associated individuals like brothers. They both had different viewpoints. According to the FBI, the existence of the Pittston Mafia had never been established independently through the use of wiretaps. Uh, mob members in Pittston or any other city had been secretly recorded by the FBI categorically referring to the organization as a separate crime group to the FBI satisfaction. The lack of hard confirmation left the FBI unwilling as late as 1969 to go on record and say there was such a thing as the Pittston Mafia. Gelatori in 1955 tells agents that Russell Buffalino controlled the territory in the clustered northeastern Pennsylvania communities of Pittston, Scranton, Carbondale, Wilts, Bear, and Hazleton. He said the crime members in all of these towns were one family. However, he said the Buffalino answered to Joe Barbara and said that Joe Barbara was Buffalino's boss. Now, can you guys smell this, the, the shit test? Do you think that that's accurate? So Joe Barbara was, as we know, a, a big mob bigwig uh, who was associated with Stephen, uh, Stefano Magadino and the Buffalino crime family. And according to Joe Latore, Barbara allegedly controlled the mafia activities in northern New York State and portions of Pennsylvania. He added that Barbara shared these supervisory duties with another unidentified mobster out of Philadelphia or Wilmington, Delaware. Joe's statements to the FBI about Barbara's importance came two years before the 57 Mafia Convention at Appalachian. In 1965, Joe would tell agents that Buffalino was a mob captain and that his authority covers mafia or organization's members located in Pittston, Scranton, Carbondale, Wilkes-Barre, and Hazleton. Latore would say he considered the mafia group one family and that uh, the family was controlled by John Montana of Buffalo, New York. At the present time, it is possibly controlled by Stefano Magadino. So say, see, see what I mean? They don't even know. They're throwing out like five different names of who's controlling what. And if anything... That just tells you how good Pittston was about keeping what they were doing sort of low key and who was controlling what. And that's a lot of the reason why Buffalino was able to go so long without any problems is because, as you see, we've just proved it with FBI paperwork that, that guys even around it didn't know what the fuck was going on. Uh, in Joe's regular debriefings over the next few years, federal agents pressed him repeatedly on the status of the Pittston mafia. The FBI's persistent questioning may have led him to ask his father for clarification. By 1966, Joe Latore would advise that Buffalino was the boss of his own family. But didn't they say earlier, not five pages up, that it was in the 1940s that he took over? So which one is it? So and that, that's why I tell you, sometimes informants don't even know what the fuck is going on. Uh, so he added that mob bosses in Hazleton 
which was just south of Carbondale, Scranton and Pittston and Wilkes Bar were grouping, and they belonged to a different mob group. And he was likely referring to the Philadelphia Mafia members Vincenzo Amato and Joe uh, and Joe Scali, who lived in the Hazelton area. Delatori, uh, you know, said what he had to say, and then Samuel Latori, who was also talking, had a completely different take. He told federal agents that Pittston had always been a separate organization. He stated that Russell Bino, Russell Buffalino, was the boss of his own family in upstate Pennsylvania. He identified the historical bosses of the organization as Stefano, excuse me, Stephen Latori, Santo Volpe, John Scandra, and then Russell Buffalino. And he did not mention any supervisory role for Joe Barbara or the Buffalo crime family. The FBI's other live sources gave completely convict, uh, conflicting information. For example, Philadelphia crime family member Harry Riccobaney told the FBI that he was of the opinion that there was not a separate family in the vicinity of Pittston, and he felt that members there belonged to families in either New York or Philadelphia areas. Rocco Scafitti, who we've talked about before, another mob informant from Philadelphia, would describe Russell Buffalo, you know, as almost like a boss. He assured the FBI that, excuse me. Uh, that Buffalino was a lieutenant for the Lucchese crime family in New York. And before, that Buffalino had belonged to the mob family of Frank Costello. It's, so nobody fucking knows. And that really truly speaks to, like, Buffalino's organization being very low profile. Uh, that two second-generation mobsters and both their fathers, who were early mob members from the same state, had no fucking idea what was going on. And the problem is the FBI didn't have a well-placed source that could give them first-hand information about Buffalino or the organization or how it operated. But by 1968, Gambino crime family member Carmine Lombardazzi, who had become one of the FBI's highest-ranking informants, who was a former captain who was familiar with mob bosses across the country, tells agents that Russell Buffalino was his personal friend and a regular dining companion and the boss of the mafia. Lombardazzi would tell agents that he meets Buffalo first, Buffalo, you know, excuse me, in 1957 at Appalachian. He says he attended the meeting as a part of the Gambino crime family delegation led by Carlo Gambino and Paul Castellano. According to Lombardazzi, Buffalo you know, was introduced to him as the head of the family in Pittston. He said the Buffalo you know's crime family had 50 members scattered throughout the surrounding towns. He said the Buffalo you know, wasn't a Lucchese crime family member whatsoever. At the, time, Lombard, at the time that Lombardazzi first met Buffalino, Joe Barbara was still alive, and he would die, as we know, in 1959. So if, Buffalo, if Buffalino was the boss then, that, that would really truly mean that either Joe Barbara was subordinate to Buffalino or Barbara was a member of another crime family altogether. And this is why I tell you the FBI never really knows. But if we look at another debriefing, Lombardazzi would advise that Joe Barbara, when living, was the head of his own family and was the boss of the family, which Barbara headed, is now known as the Buffalino family. So the contradiction between Lombardazzi's two statements is left unexplained in all of the FBI reports that I have. Joe Barbara's specific relation to, uh, relationship to the Pittston remains debatable. We don't even know. I mean, I think we do know. They were two separate en entities, you know? The reality is, is that Joe Barba was a captain within the Buffalo, Buffalo crime family and was part of an influential network of mob members born in Castamolari del Golfo. Hosting a mob meeting at his, at his estate, you know, unintentionally boosted his underworld standing more than was really merited, if we had to be honest about it. Then it came out later that Buffalo crime family boss Stefano Magadino ordered Barber to host that event. Nevertheless... Uh, Joe Barbara's documented interactions with the Pittston leadership, including his decision to shelve Stephen Latore, suggests that he has some type of leadership role, and he may have acted as an informal advisor, an impartial mediator, given the histor history ties to the city of Pittston, or he might have been Stefano Magadino's front boss. There you go. And I added that because from the documents, it says liaison, front boss. That's what that means. And that's the true de definition of a front boss. That's what a front boss does. They deflect, and it worked perfectly in this case. And informants were never able to, like, really clearly tell the FBI. 
1955, Joe said that Russell Buffalino was the supervisor of John Perino. The Latori brothers rarely used the terminology found in other mob cities. For example, they never referred to La Cosa Nostra. Instead, they used terms like mafia or organization. Instead of cap- capital regime or captain, they referred to supervisor. Perino headed up a group of mob members, including John Salvo, Samuel Cornetta, Rosario Mon- uh, Montanto, Angelo Polizzi, William and Angelo Medico, Louis Consagra, Joe Contessa, Joe Scalit, and Angelo Schiandra. And Joe called Schiandra a stooge. Angelo Piazza, an old bootlegger, Leo Valente and John Buscemi were associates. He said that William and Angelo Medico became mob members in 1949. John Buscemi, according to Dominic, uh, excuse, excuse me, according to Joseph, Dominic Nicolaimo was probably a member of the mafia. He also suspected Modesto Laquasto, who was Buffalino's bodyguard, was involved in the mafia, too. In 1963, police would arrest Laquasto after raiding a card game that he operated. Joseph said that Laquasto was hurting for money. In 1958, Joe told agents that the police raided Appalachian hap- happened too soon because many guys hadn't yet arrived. Pittston area members at Appalachian included Russell Buffalino, Angelo Schiandra, Dominic Alemo, James Ostico, uh, and Joseph said that he was surprised that Schiandra and Ostico were even there. He described Schiandra as a baby who hadn't grown up yet, and he was just a baby in the organization. Joe suspected that he was there only because he was the son of former leader John Schiandra. Besides providing the FBI with abbreviated history of the crime family's most, really his most useful contribution was to identify Cosa Nostra members in the pit scenario, which makes him a fucking rat. So by the late, by the late or the mid, I want to say the mid 60s, other sources had provided the FBI with a good breakdown of mob families in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, but Pittston remained the only crime family in the state without a member informant at the time. J. Edgar Hoover made identifying every mafia member a primary goal of federal law enforcement. Using intel supplied by Joseph and Samuel Latore, however, it posed a dilemma for the FBI because they were non-members. And according to existing FBI guidelines, agents could rely on admitted member or confidential listening devices to verify an individual's membership. You know, otherwise, the FBI wouldn't officially confirm an individual's membership, regardless of how obvious it actually might have been. The FBI's rule was similar to the mob's rule that two members unfamiliar to each other had to be officially introduced by a third member before they could acknowledge their underworld status to each other. Uh, And that's a bullshit mob rule that never existed. I'm going to tell you that. There you go. Breaking the chains, breaking the chains. But because of the lack of membership sources in Pittston, it made it impossible. And the problem is that federal agents would receive special dispensation from FBI headquarters to use intel supplied by the Latori brothers to compile, compile their membership list. And between them, the brothers identified 39 current mob members, including their fathers and their brother-in-laws. Joe, the older brother, identified the majority likely because he was more familiar with his father's former associates. And without their help, the majority of the Pittston crime family members would have remained unidentified. Samuel, for his part, would identify several mob members outside of Pittston, including uh, new crime family members Carmine Ruggiero and Charles Pafum in Providence, Rhode Island. Samuel said that he knew Genovese crime family members Joe and Pat Pagano, the Pagano brothers who owned uh, meat and poultry wholesaling businesses, had connections to Pittston. When Sammy would travel to New York City to visit them, people would ask him about Russell. He concluded that Russell was a powerful individual within the mafia. Samuel also identified Joe Guerra from Kansas City, and Guerra was the only mob member he knew from Missouri. So despite the proximity uh, between Philadelphia and Pittston, the brothers were unable to identify any Philadelphia mob members except for Joe Giorgenti, Joe Scalite, and Vincenzo Amato. Delatore's understanding of the Italian underworld was sometimes not even correct. For example, in 1955, he tells agents that Lucky Luciano was the overall head of the mafia. Criminal activity that Joe would provide law enforcement was, you know, more than interesting historical information. Throughout the 60s, he supplied the FBI with intel to target active pits and mobsters. For example, he would tell agents that a, about a mob-connected craps game that was taking place in Edwardsville which was 
a, a borough that that adjoined Kingston. Uh, Casper uh, Giamento, Russell Buffalino and Associates Casper and Modesto Laquasto were supposed to operate that game. And according to Joseph, the local police chief was protecting the game. So the Pennsylvania State Police would then intervene and shut down the game before it even really got going. But the police chief explained that he thought that the game was for locals and that he didn't realize that racketeers were involved. And Joe would say that Cappy Jumento owned Tri-City Textile Company in Pittston. Buffalino would use that business as a front for his operations. Every Tuesday morning, Buffalo Buffalino would meet bookies there and would, you know, count up money and conduct criminal activities. Joe advised that Jumento needed money and might sell the business. Joseph would tell agents that Buffalino and his underlings were attempting to muscle in on Pittston bookmakers to grab a piece of their business. According to Joseph, bookmakers feared the new arrangement would only bring more attention from law enforcement. Cappy Gimento tried to chisel in on a card game in Pittsburgh. The rival card game operator resisted Jumento's attempt to muscle him out. Rather than let Gimento control the game, he closes it down. In another instance, Jumento ordered a rival bookmaker, Ralph Rostock, to stay out of Scranton. Jumento said the ter- ter- territory belonged to him. Jumento would tell Rostock that he had to pay him to operate in the area or else he would suffer the fucking consequences. Joseph would say that Rostock would close his operation as a result. Joe would then further advise agents about a dice game controlled by Russell Buffalino Associates operating in the showroom at the Ford car dealership in Taylor, Pennsylvania. In 1960, a guy by the name of Shiowitz would tell federal agents that Russell Buffalino's mistress had given him a Cadillac automobile. Uh, Buffalino had gotten into a physical fight with her ex-husband, and news of that landed in the local newspaper's front office and on the front page of the newspaper. Joe would say that Buffalino and his wife were now on the outs. He said that Buffalino treated his wife like a housekeeper. He reported that Joe Scalit and Buffalino operated the largest horse race betting operation in northeastern Pennsylvania, which was headquartered in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Joe Latore would further advise agents that Buffalino intended to finance the bookmaking operation of two well-known gamblers named Joe Piccolo, uh, excuse me, uh, Piccolo and Pete Morgan. Joe would tell agents about a betting operation in Scranton run by George Lanzetta and his former partner, Bernard Shiowitz, who was a boxer. Uh, Originally from the underworld, uh, as the embalmer, Lanzetta, known as the embalmer, Lanzetta was originally from Boston. Boogies would give percentage to Lanzetta and Shiowitz for the privilege of betting with them. Every Monday, Shiowitz would meet with Buffalino and Cappy Gimento to provide them with their cut. Joseph would further tell agents that Buffalino wanted to sell a parking lot he owned in Pittston for $7,000. So in 1980, the Pennsylvania Crime Commission would issue a report on the Pittston crime family containing confidential information furnished by Joe and Sammy Latore. Afterwards, in an interview with the Times leader, Joe Latore complained, that report is a disservice to young professional Italian-Americans. There are plenty of good Italians. This isn't going to make do any of them any good. Uh, closing operating in a relatively obscure part of Pennsylvania, the Pittston crime family, obviously we know was small and very clannish, but it was almost impossible for law enforcement to infiltrate, even with informants. But without the Latore brothers' secret cooperation, the FBI wouldn't have got anything. And despite their lack of membership status, they were the FBI's best live sources in northeastern Pennsylvania from the 50s to the 60s. And they provided much of the early intel of the organization's history and uh, membership. And that's it. And that's how that's that's one of the unique things, too. You know, we we uh, in the past, we've talked about Harry Riccobaini giving up information to the feds and a lot of the stuff that Harry Riccobaini gave up which is historical lineage shit. In fact, most of the people we talk about on this show, with, with few exceptions, there's been a couple that are different. They all talk about the history because the FBI just wants to corroborate what they do know and what they don't. But one of the reasons why Russell Buffalino you know, had such a longevity, such a long drive in organized crime is because the FBI was able to, unable on every level to get a made member to talk. And really, in the history, in, in the annuals of war, organized crime, if we really truly look at this, the FBI was never able to touch the Buffalino you know, crime family. They were never able to touch them. Never. They never got anything on them. Russell didn't die in prison like the movie tells you. That never happened. 
Russell ran a tight ship. He did it the right way, and nobody ever told on him. They might have provided information, but it led to nothing. You know? And a lot of people don't know this. I've said it before, but but when Russell Buffalino was getting old and, and, and ready to, to, to retire, one of the things he told the mob commission, and what he agreed to was that the Pittston Mafia would die out. Obviously, we know Billy DeLeo would take over, but that really didn't last very long because under the rule or under the agreement, they weren't allowed to make made guys. So whoever was left over just kind of had to join the ranks, you know, and, and keep it going. And, and they die out because that's what the commission wanted. Why that's the case, I don't know. But I suspect it's because they realized that anybody else taking over the, the crime family wouldn't have been able to do a good job. Because Russell was very, very integral to the early days of organized crime. Cuba, everything. You name it, he was involved in everything. And who knows why certain places go defunct? Who knows why he agreed to do that? But I think it probably had a lot to do with the fact that Russell was very, very powerful. And I think new mob bosses that were taking over did not want him to elevate somebody that could be a thorn in their side because Russell was a dignitary in many ways. He was a forward thinking man. He was a business guy and he knew the right decisions to make. And the last thing that they want is somebody that they don't know as well coming in and creating a shit storm for them. It's all about control. It's all about control. That's all organized crime is. We've seen it from every single angle. We always have. All right. So, we are going to end here for today. But what we're going to do next week is we are going to get into the DeMeo murders. We're going to have another big Q&A. We are also going to get into the mini biographies, probably two every show. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, once again, thank you for listening in. Have a great weekend, everybody. And uh, we will be doing some more content on YouTube and probably live this weekend. So, uh, you know, keep uh, keep an eye out for that on YouTube. If you haven't liked, shared, or subscribed, please do so on YouTube. We would appreciate it. Uh, other than that, we're going to get out of here for today, and we will talk to all of you very, very soon.